Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, I know we're normally in a different talk room, but uh, it's under construction, so we'll not need to do this room. Um, today we're uh, pleased to welcome Dick Nemer from UC Santa Barbara to talk about his research into uh, uh, botnets. I think it was a Tor pig botnet, yep. right? And uh, their experiences after taking over the botnet for a period of a week or so. Anyways, um, please give a round of applause. Okay, thank you for having me. Uh, I love your conference room. It's just really <laughs> state of the art. I'd expect nothing better for Google. Um, if you want to change the uh, slide. So I'm not at the slide changer, so I'm going to re you know, regularly be saying, please change the slide. So I thought first, just so we're all on the same page, I'd, I'd just go over some terminology real quick. Um, I assume most of you know all of this, but at least we're using the same names. A bot's an application that performs some action or set of actions on the behalf of a remote controller. It gets installed on a victim's machine. In the old days, we used to call these zombies. So once, once you have a compromised machine that someone's working, uh, using remotely, that's uh, what we refer to as a bot. It's modular in the sense that you can plug in different kinds of, uh, of malware for doing different exploits and so forth. And in, uh, today we'll be talking about Torpig malware. Uh, when you have a collection of these infected machines that are controlled by uh, uh, usually a single individual, it's referred to as a botnet. Uh, the way of controlling it is by means of a uh, control channel, which requi is required to send commands to the bot and also to receive data back from the bot. Originally, most of these control channels were IRC channels. Today, we're seeing more of them being HTTP and HTTPS, uh, and uh, some of them are actually peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, of course, in a peer-to-peer, -peer, then you don't have the central control that you do in the others. Uh, the person in charge of this is usually referred to as a bot herder or the bot master or the controller. He owns or controls the channel, sends the commands to each of the bots, and collects the data from the botnet army. Uh, usually the motivation is power or money. The motivation used to be put another notch in your belt. Today it's very, very much uh, uh, money driven. Yeah, so here, how about if I put a red dot on you when I want you to change it? Okay, next, please. Okay, so let's talk a little bit specifically about Torpig. Um, before, I, before I do that, I want to just say Torpig is actually delivered uh, by another malware called Mebroot. But I'm, I'm only going to tell you about those two lines right there about Mebroot. Uh, so anyway, uh, Torpig is distributed via Mebroot. Mebroot's really a malware platform. It uh, provides you kind of like with a middleware, so you can install uh, different applications and so forth. For Torpig, it injects itself into 29 different applications. What? OK, sorry. Uh, it uh, injects itself into 29 different applications. These are, are, are uh, all sorts of applications like web browsers and uh, Skype and, and so forth. Uh, it steals sensitive information. Uh, it's one that's been supposedly called one of the most dangerous um, botnets around. It, it steals, of course, passwords, HTTP posts, um, bank credentials, um, logins to all different kinds of accounts and so forth and we'll give you some data on that a, a little bit later. It uses HTTP injection for phishing which is actually web in a browser phishing so it's not detectable by any of the current phishing uh, detection software um, and it uses something called domain flux to locate the CNC server which is is changing regularly and I'll, I'll talk more about that specifically about those last two three more specifically in a little bit. Just to say something about Mebroot, Mebroot is spread via uh, drive-by downloads, and it's basically a sophisticated rootkit that overwrites the master boot record, and then once you, uh, after it overwrites the master boot record, it waits a little while, and then it reboots the system, and then it's doing everything at boot time, and uh, again, it's not detected. Okay, oh yeah, this one's gonna be fun, one more time. It, okay, so, Basically, this is, this is a pretty sophisticated um, group of people. Well, I, I don't know that they're sophisticated. Their software is rather sophisticated. The architecture of the system is rather sophisticated. The one thing, two things on this slide that are not things that the, that the Torpig or Mebroot folks did is up here where we're talking about hacked web servers. So these are 
just the normal legitimate servers that are out there. Of course, they're vulnerable. And, and so the Mebroot folks have hacked into them and put software on them so that we can get the whole process started, which I'll tell you about in a little while. Um, I shouldn't say all of these are innocent because a large number of them are actually the porn sites and the belief is that the porn sites are probably getting paid to have this uh, software put on, on there. There's the innocent victim here. Other than that, we've got, we've got the drive-by download server, which initially uh, puts the Mebroot software on your system to try and see whether or not you're vulnerable. We've got the Mebroot CNC, which controls the Mebroot itself. We have the Torpig uh, command and control, which controls Torpig, and then a separate injection server. So let's see how this works. We start off with the innocent victim connecting to one of these legitimate sites. Uh, one more, please. Uh, when, it, when it connects to that site, the iframe that comes back down has a DTAB tag on it that causes the innocent victim to go over to the drive-by download server. Okay, so uh, he goes over to the drive-by download server, the drive-by download server goes and uh, downloads the, the uh, Mebroot software. The Mebroot software looks for a number of vulnerabilities in the system. If it if any of those vulnerabilities are there, then the innocent victim now becomes a bot. I just love those devils, huh? Okay, I, oh, I should say this slide was actually, uh, there's a um, figure we have in the paper that you guys had a reference to, and this slide was done by an FBI guy for us, and, and then, well, I changed it some because he had UCSB looking like angels, and we. We didn't feel like we wanted that, that knowledge, but I want to acknowledge the FBI for doing the animation here. Okay, so now, now that, the, uh, that we have the bot here, the first thing it does is connects to the med, no. Oh yeah, go ahead. <laughs> it's much easier when I'm doing the finger things than I know. Okay, so it basically connects, the, the, as, as soon as it's infected, it connects to Mebroot CNC. Now, as I said, Mebroot is, is, can be used for other malware. In this case, it's being used for delivering the TorPig malware, and it basically downloads three TorPig modules onto, onto the innocent victim's machine. These modules connect to the TorPig command and control every 20 minutes. And um, one of the other things that, uh, so once it connects to TorPig command and control, first thing TorPig Tor command and control does is download a configuration file. This configuration file, um, I'm about eight slides ahead, but it'll all come back. You know, if you hear it twice, then you'll remember it, okay? Uh, the configuration file has about 300 financial institutions on it, such that when you visit those financial institutions, it's gonna do a phishing attack on you. The other thing that happens is that every 20 minutes when the victim connects to Torpig, it gives it any new stolen data that it has. Okay, uh, so I was telling you about those financial institutions. Whenever the victim goes to one of those financial institutions, Torpig connects to the injection server. Oh, okay, that was a two, I didn't know if that was a two-way arrow or one-way arrow. Connects to the Torpig uh, injection server. The injection server, uh, through a process which I'll detail later, gives it a particular customized phishing page for that for that particular financial institution, and uh, that, that it looks exactly like all their other pages do. Like the one for PayPal looks like a piece of crap. And I, I shouldn't say that since you're gonna distribute this, but yes, it does. The other ones look kind of nice, like they were prepared by professional people. And I'll show you examples of that. So this is basically how things are working when Torpig is owned by the criminals. Every 20 minutes, it's connecting here, giving it any new stolen data. If the uh, central command and control has any new commands, it downloads those. Every two hours, it connects to Mebroot to see whether Mebroot has anything to do, okay? So what did we do? So we're the UCSB gauchos. That's actually the, uh, the uh, uh, what do you call it? The, mascot for UCSB, which I thought was kind of nice for us, although it's a black hat, not a gray hat. So what we did is we put a vulnerable machine out on the net. It got infected by Mebroot and Torpig. And uh, of course, we were running it in VMware and sampling everything it was doing. We re re uh, reverse engineered the software. We broke the encryption that was going on. And again, I'll give you all the details of this later. And basically, 
we took over so that uh, what was happening is the innocent victim was going to start delivering to us and getting commands from us. And, uh, and more importantly, uh, it was not sending the stuff to the criminals. And so basically, for 10 days, this is the position we were in. Uh, we had 100, over 180,000 unique uh, machines connecting to us from over 1.2 million unique IPs, which we'll talk about why is that different in, in a little while too. And, and so we had all the information. Um, remember I said that there's a connection here every two hours to, to uh, Mebroot, command and control. And we fully expected that they would download some new information that would kick us off. Uh, this didn't happen for 10 days anyway. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you why it did happen after 10 days. Uh, also, um, we thought they would maybe come at us some, some other ways. I think that's the end of this. Oh, so that goes away and it goes back to them. And let's go to the next slide. So let me talk a little bit about um, how the phishing page works. So the, when the, configura the configuration file that is downloaded um, from Torpig and can, can get updated regularly if you want, it turns out it doesn't get updated that often. Uh, but it has domains of interest, and in our case, there are approximately 300 um, financial institutions. And you know, you tell me what financial institution you're with; it was probably on there. It's uh, countries all over the world. Not, um, uh, I don't know if we had any in China, but but we had, you know, Australia, New Zealand, uh, the UK, Europe, uh, um, and all over the U.S. and so forth. Okay. So what happens when when one of these domains of interest is is visited, the Torpig software uh, issues a request to the injection server. The injection server specifies a particular trigger page on that domain. And the idea is that, and, and it also uh, gives a URL to the Torpig software. When the um, user of, the, of that particular bot gets to that particular trigger page, the Torpig sends the URL, invokes the URL, what the URL does is downloads a page. Yeah, yeah, it's a problem for me. I'd like to step way away from that mic, but I don't know if that's okay with the other people. Okay, so uh, so basically, uh, when you get to the trigger page, the uh, the Torpig invokes the URL, gets a phishing page back from the injection server. And what it does through a uh, man in a browser attack, it goes in and displays that, that page for the user to look at, okay? Um, let's see, what do I wanna say? So the phishing page reproduces the look and style of the target website. So here's an example page for Wells Fargo, part, part of the page anyway, where you can see it's, it, it looks just like Wells Fargo. If you bank at Wells Fargo, that looks at like what you're bank pages normally looks like. In fact, uh, you know, one of the things you're told to do is look up here to see whether or not it, whether or not it says Wells Fargo and all at the end it, at the end it says dot dot, you know, dot hacker at uh, bad domain or something. But it has the, it has the right domain there. It's it's doing SSL that all looks legitimate and it's not caught by any of the any of the phishing detectors. Of course, it asks for things like first name, last name, date of birth, social security number, mother's maiden name. If you go to the next one, just so we don't, this is one for Bank of America, and it asks some more questions there, which I can't read from here, and I'm sure you can't either. It says, oh, your father's middle name, and what city was your mother born, all those sorts of things. Once you fill these out, you basically, you know, they're, they're right, you're ripe for identity theft, okay? And, uh, and people would fill them out. The interesting thing was they would fill them out, uh, some of them that we saw, they would fill them out and then they would send a message to the PayPal security guy and say, why are you asking for this stuff? I thought I gave all this to you before, but they did it after they filled it out. So it's you know, kind of interesting. Okay, next. Okay, so let's talk about domain flux. Domain flux is the way that you find out what command and control server to connect to. So first, let me give you a little bit of history. When, um, if you're looking to take down a botnet, First thing you want to do is either get one of your bots, uh, one of your machines to be infected like we did, or you find infected machines out there. And if you find the infected machines, you can take them off. Okay, you can cleanse them and, 
and, and, and fix all the vulnerabilities. But if you take one machine out or 10 or 15 or 200 out of 180,000, you don't have much effect. So what you really want to do is you want to go for the command and control servers. Okay? And so if, you use a, uh, if the command and control server uses a, a static IP address, uh, then you can block or remove that host. So you, you can't go, go to that domain. Or if you're uh, law enforcement, you can go there and physically capture the machine. And they actually had done that in the past for one of the Torpig machines where they actually captured one and got a lot of, a lot of data on it from that and found out who was compromised. Okay, so, but remember this is an arms race. You know, it's the hackers against the good guys and it's constantly, you, you start uh, thwarting the common way that they're doing things and they raise the bar, okay? And so the first thing they did to raise the bar was something called FastFlux. And with FastFlux, you have the same domain name all the time, but where it goes to uh, changes, okay? And uh, in this case, you just block the domain name, right? What they did in Torpig, and they actually do this in Configure also, uh, and uh, there were some earlier bots that did this. The idea is that the bots periodically generate a new command and control to go to. So when the software that's downloaded on the bot has, has a domain generation algorithm downloaded on it. In the case of Torpig, it changes once a week. Uh, for, these, for, for these domains, as I say, they change often. They use a, a local date system time as input. And what you do is a bot master then just needs to register this domain. When it changes, all of the information starts coming to, to the bot master as, as it rolls over. Okay? Um, what happens is if you want to defend against this, you have to go and figure out all the possible domains that they could be registering, register them before them, uh, before the bot master does, and then you can take it over. And you'll, you'll see that that's what we did, but it's not as easy as it sounds. Next, please. Okay, so let's, let's talk explicitly about domain flux for Torpig. As I said, each, each bot has a domain generation algorithm on it. We reverse engineered this uh, domain generation algorithm. It also has three fixed domains that it goes to if everything else fails. Now, for the domain generation algorithm, it does two things. One is it generates a weekly domain name, which I'll refer to as, as WD. It also, at a, at a daily rate if it needs to, it generates a daily domain name. And then every 20 minutes, the bot attempts to connect in, tor in order to the weekly domain name .com, the weekly, and if that fails, and what I mean by if it fails, if that domain's not available, it's not out there, or if it connects to that domain and that domain doesn't respond in an appropriate way, doesn't, doesn't have the right protocol, uh, then it'll go to wd.net. If that fails, it'll go to roll over to wd.biz. If all three of those fail, then what it does is it tries a daily domain. And it generates a daily domain, it tries dd.com. If that fails, it goes to dd.net. If that fails, it goes to dd.biz. If all, if all of those fail, then it tries three fixed domains that are hard-coded in the, in, in the software. Okay? So in the past, while we were watching Torpig, it turns out that the criminals normally registered wd.com and sometimes wd.net. Okay, so, which you, so they're, they're interested in efficiency. First one it's going to, they get. And uh, so what, if you go on. So what we did is, is um, we wanted to get them to come to us instead of going to the criminals. Okay, and so first thing we did is reverse engineered the name generation algorithm and, uh, and figured out what the command and control protocol was. And as is always the case, one of our grad students noticed that the criminals hadn't registered wd.com or wd.net or any of those for about three weeks out from what the current date was. So we went and registered those domain names. Okay, so we registered uh, wd.com and wd.net. Okay. Uh, the next, it was either later that day or the next, and we registered them for the next for, for three weeks out, from, from January 29th to the uh, whatever, whatever three weeks out was, the fifth, uh, 22nd or something like that, uh, February 22nd. Oh, here, I can, I can read what's on my slide, then I'll, I'll know it, okay? So uh, we registered these domains ourselves. 
uh, WD.com, WD.net, either the same day or the next day, the criminals registered WD.biz. Okay? So we figured what they were going to do was going to do a denial of service on our two names so it would roll over to WD.biz, you know, and then download new software and we'd be out of business. Okay? As it turns out, that didn't happen for 10 days anyway. Uh, uh, what did happen is on February 4th, through Mebroot, which it connects to every two hours, they pushed a new TorPig binary, binary, which had a new uh, domain generation algorithm. That domain generation algorithm was also one that was dynamic, so you couldn't calculate it out weeks ahead of time like we did. Uh, the new domain generation algorithm was based on the highest hit Twitter for the particular day. And so you, 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 so you, had, to, you, know, you had to be kind of on top of it. And, it. and you could believe we were talking to the Twitter folks to go and see if we couldn't get the knowledge first. And we, we actually did later on, but I, uh, that's another talk. Okay, so basically we controlled the botnet for 10 days. We got about uh, just short of nine uh, gigabits of, of Apache logs. We got 69 gigabits of uh, uh, PCAP data. Uh, and I'll tell you more about those in a minute. So let me say a little bit about how we did our sinkholing. Um, we, we purchased uh, hosting from two different hosting providers. And there's hosting providers that are known to be non-responsive out there. I mean, you might ask, hey, if you, know, if you know the command and control is here, why don't you just call the hosting provider and say, hey, take that guy down. He's a bad guy. Well, these guys get people to go and, and let them host them and so forth because, they're, uh, because they are un unresponsive. And, and those are well known. So we went to two different ones because we wanted redundancy here. We also registered WD.com and WD.net with two different registrars. And this was actually very beneficial because uh, the seventh day that we owned it, evidently on the, on the sixth day, some Spanish bank reported to the, to the uh, uh, registrar that we, we were doing bad stuff. And they tried to call us, but of course we had given them a bad phone number. I mean, we were buried through about four levels because we didn't want to get our kneecaps shot off or anything, you know, when, when, when this came down. And, uh, and, and so we found out too late, but they suspended us on, on uh, January 31st, but we had the backup one, so we didn't lose any data at all. So that redundancy uh, really worked out. We set up Apache web servers to re receive the bot request, recorded all of the network traffic, and, uh, and the other thing we did is we automatically downloaded and removed the data from our hosting providers uh, we we uh, encrypted it with AES, downloaded it, and, and so that if anybody took over the physical machines or actually broke into the, the machines, that data wouldn't be available for them. Next, please. Um, oh, interesting thing is that, as I said, we were, we were set to take over on, on January 29th. Well, a week earlier, we enabled our software on the host, our, our command and control stuff to, to collect this a week earlier, and immediately 359 infected machines connected to us. So these guys had their clock set at least a week earlier and, and thought that they were already supposed to be reporting to, to that particular domain. That was kind of nice because we knew at least it would, you know, it would probably work. We didn't know how well it would work, would work however. Next, please. Okay, so before I talk more about, uh, about the kinds of data we got and, and so forth, let me just say, you know, when you're, when you're collecting this kind of information or you have the potential to collect this information, you've got to be very careful about what you do with it. And so we basically had two principles that we set for ourselves uh, in, in terms of the data collection. And the first one said the sinkhole botnet should be operated so that any harm and or damage to victims and targets of attacks would be minimized. So we didn't, you know, we got somebody's compromised already, and we'd want to make things worse for them. Okay, so what we did, if you hit, uh, so what we did is, um, first, remember I said when they connect to the command and control, you have to do the right protocol back to them. And uh, what we did was, we, we did what we called the OKN message. The OKN message is like a null message. It just basically says, yep, I'm the guy you want to be talking to, and I don't have anything new for you. We've had people since our paper was released on the, on, on the uh, web say, 
well, why didn't you put a new blank configuration file? Because remember, the configuration file contains the names of the, of, of the financial institutions that, where they were going to do the new phishing attack for. Okay? Well, we don't know what the side effects of that would be. Okay? And we wanted to, you know, we didn't do this stuff just because we wanted to be good people. We also didn't want to go to jail. You know, if you, start, if you start sending things down to their machine, telling it to do different, do, do things, I mean, we were just collecting. We were a passive collector except for the OKN message. Uh, but we were really concerned of, uh, suppose the, the compromise machine is something like a bank, and when you send down a, a blank configuration file, it has a side effect that, you know, turns off all of the uh, life support things or something. I, you know, uh, probably won't be that bad, but one never knows. And, and so we didn't do that. As I mentioned before, we removed the data from the servers regularly. We stored the data offline in encrypted form. In fact, one of the things I did that first Sunday after we took it over was send someone out to Costco to buy the biggest offline data storage device that we could and so we could you know, store the stuff in there and lock it in a, lock it in a safe so we would be, be good citizens. Okay. Principle number two says the sinkhole botnet should collect enough information to enable notification and remediation of affected parties. And so we worked with law enforcement, in particular with, a, with the FBI and the uh, Department of Defense Cybercrime Units. Uh, I, I'm going to say more about that later. Uh, trying to get to do an initial contact with law enforcement isn't as easy as one might think it is. You don't dial 911. Okay? Uh, and so I'll, I'll tell you more about that later. Uh, as a result of dealing with the FBI in particular, we put, we're put in contact with a bunch of bank security officers. I know the chief security officers at banks that I never knew existed before. You know, or, or how could Scotland have that many different banks? You know, and mm -hmm. So uh, that was kind of interesting. And uh, we also worked with the ISPs, which you also found there, you know, trying to work with an ISP where you're cold calling them and saying, hey, you know, you really should take this guy off or you should leave us on or whatever isn't always the easiest thing to do. Okay, so let's talk about the data. Uh, as I mentioned before, the bot connects to the Torpig command and control every 20 minutes. It does this by an HTTP post. Um, it sends a header. The header is encrypted. The header has in it a, a um, timestamp. Uh, and that timestamp is the time that it initially got infected. And it's little things like this that the Tor Pig folks did for us that made it real easy to find out, is this a newly infected machine or has this been around? So you can, so you can get an idea of, uh, you know, because if you jump in and take over on January 29th and it's sending stuff to you, well, a lot of those machines have been infected, one would think, for quite a while before that. So you should get a big spike in the beginning, which we did. But, you know, what you want to know is how many are getting infected each day, you know, of, of the 10 days we owned it. And that timestamp was one way that that worked. The IP address, this is interesting. You'll see that we had, we had, one, um, we had one machine that had 700, it was either just short of 700 or just over 700 different IP addresses over the 10-day period. And if you see how many 20-minute connections there are in that, it was almost like it had a different IP every 20 minutes, okay? Um, and so this was, this was something that was interesting, which I'll talk about again, is we believe that many of the reports on the size of botnets that you've seen before are inflated, you know, probably an order of magnitude more than what they, what they really are, and I'll, and I'll tell you why we believe that. Um, so there's a timestamp, the IP address, proxy ports, uh, the operating system version, the locale. Uh, this is a, a unique ID, which I'll tell you more about. Uh, and, it, and basically, it was that that we used to find out how many unique machines we had, as opposed to unique IP addresses. And then, what was the Torpig build and what was the version number? Okay, so I said these guys were professional software developers. They did all the good things you should do if you, you know, if you're developing software. So let's talk about the network ID. It's an eight-byte value. It's used for encrypting the header and the data, and uh, it's derived from hard disk information or a volume serial number. And so as it turns out, we could also tell whether or not, oh, well, I have down here, we could detect when there's a VMware machine because then it always has that same number on all of them. Okay, and so, um, you know, unless someone went to the effort to go and, and, and change that. 
Um, and so this serves as a, a convenient, unique identifier. Uh, the, the body then, the, the optional body, if it has any stolen information to send, has any newly compromised accounts, anything that was posted, everything that was posted was sent. Okay, so if you're doing your email, you know, your web email through posting, we got all of that. Okay, um, okay, and so when it sends this, the NID is in the clear, that's used to encrypt the header, and so once you know the encryption algorithm, it's fairly easy to decrypt all, all of the messages. And, and, and uh, I should have mentioned it before, for Torpig, the encryption algorithm wasn't very sophisticated at all. For Mebroot, they use a, we, we hope they use a very sophisticated encryption algorithm because no one's been able to, to break it yet. Okay, and, and obviously they're two different ones. Okay, next please. Okay, so I was talking about size estimation. This is a count of number of infections. Normally when you read about botnets, it's usually based on the unique IP addresses. Okay? It turned out, uh, this is prob problematic for a number of reasons. If you have DHCP, DHCP connections, you know, those in theory could change every time that you log on, or more often you'll see. If you're like me, I found that when I was on Verizon getting DHCP, I think I had the same IP address for the four years or whatever I was on Verizon, you know, and, and so, and I'd, and I'd shut the machine down, you know, pretty regularly, so, um, and so, you know, you, most people say, well, why is that a big deal? Well, for some place it is, places it is, and in particular in uh, Germany, Germany and Italy and Bell South are, are people who have a short time uh, to live on it and also uh, change them almost every time you're connecting. Okay, for our count, we based it on the header information. We based it basically on that, that NID that I told you about. We found, because we thought that should be unique, okay, since it was, it was based on a SCSI drive and if that wasn't there on, on some other software that should be unique. We found that we had a, a, a few and when I say a few, I, I, I don't remember the exact number, but it was like in the hundreds that had repeated, re, repeated, that value was repeated and we could tell by, from the location and so forth that it shouldn't be. And so we used the NID, we used the uh, country of origin, the locale, and something else. And those, we were, we were convinced was, was unique. So here it shows you new Torpig IPs per hour. You can see, oh, I don't know if I mentioned this here, let me see. Uh, we saw 1.2 million unique IPs, and we saw 180,000 unique hosts. So as I said, an order of magnitude difference there. Here's the unique IPs. You can see we got this big spike. This is Saturday. It was midnight on January 25th that we took it over. So we got a little trickling of things beforehand. Remember, if we went back a week before, we already had 300 and, and some almost 400 connected to us. But uh, we already up here are above uh, 14,000, uh, something like 14,500 uh, on the initial connection. Uh, one thing to note about this is, is this is every two days here, but you'll see this is diurnal in terms of people connecting. You know, eight o'clock in the morning, and there's, a, there's a lot of these that are, are, are co um, commercially owned machines. And you know, around eight o'clock, you see a big, influx of people logging on, it drops down at night, and it goes up, and so uh, this is work that uh, David Dagan at Georgia Tech had noticed before, too, is this diurnal effect, and that definitely was here. Over on, 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 yes? Diurnal for which country? What's that? Diurnal for which country? Oh, you can, well, you can see things going across, but if you take, if you take Western Europe and the U.S., and sort of collapse that in, you know, it's, okay. the, the effect of there is, is, is close enough that you'll still see it. Yeah, this is on, on, these were based on where we were collecting the data. Okay, but you're right, I mean, you know, it was fun, you know, because we didn't know how well this was gonna work. At midnight, we're sitting there watching this sucker, and you could just see, watch, watch it coming across. And the other thing was, that was, remember, that was Saturday at midnight, and then we had, uh, you know, another spike, which is probably maybe this one here, was then on, on Monday morning, okay? Because there were people who weren't connecting on Sunday, you know, and then start and then connect to Monday morning. But yeah, so so to answer your question, that's kind of mixed in there. But you still got it, even though you had a combination of all of them, okay? Because it was basically, uh, you know, a, a, 
um, nine hour worst case difference between those and, and, and it smooths itself out. And you know, not everybody gets starts at eight, some start at 10, you know, the whole thing, okay? So here's the, uh, using our uh, host NIDs for it. And again, you'll see there was a, you know, big spike in the beginning, but what you notice here is that it, you know, that it, that it drops off and, uh, and we don't get that many, uh, as many unique ones. If you go to, it, it, well, no, so, so also the average number of new IPs uh, per, uh, now I'm trying to remember whether that was per hour. Well, this one's per hour. So the average number, yeah, yeah, that would be for per hour. The average number of new IPs per hour was 4,690, whereas uh, for the, for the uh, new unique host was 705. Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, other interesting thing here, if you look at the cumulative number of infections, uh, it's linear for unique IP addresses. So it, you know, it just keeps, keeps going up linear like this. In the case of when we're using the host, it turns out that we had 75% of the new IDs in the first 48 hours. And then it, you know, and then it kind of flattens out. It didn't, doesn't completely flatten out because there are new infections going on all the time, but you know, not, not at this linear rate that you see here. Okay, next slide, please. So let me talk a little bit about the, the, the different threats. The, the obvious threat is the, the theft of financial data. But I also want to say a little bit of denial of service, proxy servers, and privacy threats, which I have to say are all conjecture on our part, but we back it up with, you know, with, with real numbers. Whereas the theft of, theft, little, theft of financial data, we have hard, hard data on that that actually happened. Next one, please. Okay. So uh, there were uh, 8,310 unique accounts from 410 different financial institutions. The top five were PayPal, Posta Italiano, Capital One, E-Trade, and Chase. Uh, I think in the paper I might list some more. Uh, the, the number six was somebody who was doing me a favor and I said I wouldn't put their name in the paper so, or on the talk, so I only, I cut it down from 10 to five. But you think of whatever bank you're at, you know, Wachovia, Chase, uh, uh, Bank of America, all of those you're gonna see in here. And, uh, and the other thing, which I don't think I mentioned to you before, the other thing that Tor Pig does, it goes to the password manager and steals passwords and, uh, from there, okay? And so 38% of the credentials that were stolen were stolen from the, from the password manager, all right? And, uh, and we know that because, again, these guys, that, well, men and women that wrote Tor Pig did a good job. They labeled it a specific way to say this came from the password manager. So, so it makes it really nice to go and analyze this data. You know, we're, we're kind of going like, yay, you know? And, then, you know? and things we didn't even think that they should put in there that they did, like the build number that I was telling you about. There's a different build number. Uh, I don't remember exactly how many of them there are. It's in our, uh, the number's in our latest paper, but let's say about 12 different ones. But it turns out that the software with the different build numbers is uh, exactly the same. And so the, the thing that we and other folks we've been working with are conjecturing about that is that they're actually selling their services. And they're selling it to, you know, different ones with the distinguished by the different build numbers. Okay, and, uh, and there's some, you know, other work been done that, that, that substantiates that that's a, a, a reasonable thing to, to guess. Okay, we also got 1,660 credit cards. Top five were Visa, MasterCard, American Express, Maestro, and Discover. 49% of them were from the US, 12% from Italy, and 8% from Spain, and then you know, uh, dribbled off after that. Typically, we had one credit card per person, but there were exceptions. Oh, I thought I had the exception in there. Uh, somebody had 30 credit cards that were compromised, okay? Uh, and so we looked a little more into the, see if we could get a little more information about this particular uh, bot, and it turns out that it was somebody who was providing a service for other folks and holding their credit cards for them. So, you know, if you sleep well at night to know, you know, you, you have your, whether it be, you know, people doing your flight reservations or whatever, beware, okay? Um, so, um, one question is, well, what, what's the value of the financial information? Well, Symantec in 2008 estimated 
that credit card value ranges from 10 cents to $25, okay? Um, oh, and I should mention, what, how do we get in this business, you may be asking, okay? Well, we, we, have, a, we have an NSF grant to uh, study the underground economy, okay? And, and so this is, what we're talking about today is sort of the first step of that, somebody who's collecting this stuff. And it turns out that the people that collect it, they're never gonna get caught using a, a credit card because you know, they're selling it to someone else. And when they're selling them in bulk, that's when you get this 10 cents value. If, some, if somebody's out there selling an in, individual credit card because they're a waiter at a restaurant and don't have anything to do with cyber security, they you know, copied it off or, or used their cell phone, you don't even have to write anymore. Uh, and uh, th that's, that's closer to 25. Um, so anyway, bank accounts uh, range from $10 to $1,000. And so what we did is we uh, looked at the new accounts and the new credit cards that we got. So we didn't count anything twice. And this graph, which I'm sure no one other than the people sitting right under it with the bad necks uh, can see, um, I believe this one here is the, the count of new credit cards and, uh, and new accounts. And this one is the max and this one is the min. And, um, and the value, if you, if you look at, take those, both those minimum values, the value over the 10-day period would be 83,000 minimum and up to 8.3 million uh, at, at the maximum, okay? Assuming you, you turn all of those over, okay? Next. Um, okay, so another threat I just wanna say a little bit about is a denial of service threat. There were more than 60,000 active hosts at any given time. And uh, so what we did is we used IP2 location database to determine network speeds. And we found out that uh, cable and DSL modem make up about 65% of the infected hosts. Okay. And we used the cable modem and DSL speeds in the US because they're well known to be the slowest in the world. And, uh, and, and we used that uh, upstream bandwidth, which is 435 kilobits per second and did the math on this, and this yields greater than 17 gigabits of, uh, um, of, of uh, information per second from DSL and cable, okay? And with that, you could do a pretty good denial of service attack on somebody if you want to aim it at the same person, if you want to do. Uh, the other thing is that the corporate net networks made up about 22% of the infected hosts, and they have even faster speeds, and so that's, that uh, number of seven is very conservative there. So the possibility of using the bot for a denial of service, which used to be the original use for botnets. I remember the attack on CNN back in 2002 and so forth, it was a, just to bring it down. In fact, there was an attack recently on, was it, no, couldn't have been Twitter. Was it Twitter? Yeah, okay. All right, so let's look at the next one. Oh, I told you that, good. Just in case I forget, you know. Okay, proxy servers, uh, when, when Torpig, uh, when, when a machine first gets compromised, Torpig opens both a SOX and an HTTP proxy. 20% uh, of the infected machines that are on, in the botnet are publicly reachable. And uh, we went to, spam, to the spam house blacklist and it turns out that only 2.45% of those are on the blacklist, which means the, the other 97% are, are usable. And, uh, uh, of the 20% that's publicly reachable. And so these could very easily be used for spamming, okay? And you know, and I, I would venture a guess that most of the spam that we all get, a good portion of it is, is done by botnets, you know, illegal botnets. Okay, next. Okay, privacy. Um, remember we collect everything that's posted gets sent to the uh, uh, command and control. So that means if you're doing webmail, web chat, traffic, forum message, and so forth. And so we decided, uh, we just wanted to look at this a little bit. Uh, I'll tell you later when I talk about uh, ethics, you know, there's this real question of should you be looking at people's mail? And in, and in fact, when I contacted the, the DOD cipher guy, uh, cyber crime guy, he said, uh, yeah, I'll talk to you if you have DOD information. I said, we do, and then he wanted it, but he said, I don't want any of the email. He said, I don't, even, I, don't, I don't want there to be any chance that I even have that on my stuff. 
And so, you know, there's a, there's a, lot, of, a lot of problem about that. So we try to do a, a hands-off, hands-on, I don't know, a, <laughs> approach to, to getting some information about what kind of people's machines are compromised. And so we focused on, on uh, around 6,500 messages that were in English, because we didn't want to have to bother trying to translate them. And uh, that were 250 characters or longer. And uh, it turns out that about 14% of those were about jobs and resumes, looking for jobs and resumes. 7% were discussing money. How do we know this? We took keywords that would be obvious keywords to search for uh, uh, in, in doing this sort of thing. 7% discuss money, 6% sport fans, 5% preparing for exams, and 4% doing uh, partners, sex, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I should take that line out of there, I guess. Online, okay. Um, interesting thing about it is that um, a lot of them are concerned about online security. You know, we saw all these messages, like one of the interesting messages said, uh, yeah, I'm back online now. I had some malware, but I'm cleaned up and everything's fine now. <laughs> I go, yeah, sure you are, <laughs> right? Uh, and 10% uh, of them specifically mentioned security and malware. And as I said, some of these folks, right after filling out the phishing page, went to whatever the financial institution is and, you know, and, and had this irate message off to them, which we also got because they were you know, using web, web mail for this. And it said, why am I doing this? You know, but they already did it. Okay, next. Okay, so one of the things we did since we had so many passwords that were collected, we had almost 300,000 unique uh, uh, credentials. Um, what we did is, what, what, can we, what can we say about these things? And uh, so we analyzed them. We found out that 28% of the victims reused their passwords on multiple domains. Probably, you know, not such, such a big surprise. Um, if you go to the next one, we say, well, can we get more information about this? We know they're reusing them, okay? Um, and so we said, well, how strong are these passwords? You know, if we weren't capturing them this way, you know, if you use usual password guessing, how strong, how strong would they be? Okay, so we used John the Ripper, and, and we had to take, you know, some of these passwords and put them in a Unix form in, in order to do that. Okay, but we used John the Ripper uh, to assess the strength of the path passwords, and it turned out uh, when we did that, we had 173,000 unique passwords, getting rid of all the duplicates. Um, in, in running, running John the Ripper in the default mode, you know, no, no uh, dictionary or anything. Is it? Can, can you hear? Uh, did I turn it off? Can you hear me? Hello? Okay. Should I sign? We're going for <laughs> Oh, it blinks because it's bad? See, you never tell. Does it blink because it's good or something? Supposed to be done by one. I thought we started seven minutes late. We go seven. Okay. Um, so basically, we used John the Ripper on the unique password file, 173,000 of them, and we found out that. And this was we ran it first just in the default mode with no no special dictionary or anything like that, and we got uh, 56,000 of them in just over an hour, in, in six, 65 minutes. Uh, we then used a large word list, and we got 14,000 in the next 10 minutes. So we're talking about you know, an hour and a quarter, and we got 14,000 of them. So 40% were cracked in less than 75 minutes. 
We then ran it for uh, 24 hours and got another 30,000. And if you go to the slide, uh, which again you can't see, this is just gives you that information. We got the 40% uh, uh, of them and then the next bump there and then the 24 hours there. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, so uh, what about, let me say a little bit about criminal retribution, a little bit about law enforcement. These are kind of, maybe this should have been lessons learned instead of what about, but, uh, uh, and repatriating the data and ethics. So if we go to criminal retribution. So the biggest, big concern on January 25th, the first day, it was midnight when we took over this thing. Uh, I wasn't at the lab, but I had a, a a uh, grad student reporting regularly, sending out emails. Says, now we have this many accounts. We have this much data. Uh, you know, it was like the sky is falling. Okay. So Sunday afternoon, uh, uh, we were in the lab talking about what to do. And uh, my biggest concern at the time was the criminals, because these guys were known to be bad guys, are, are going to come to get us, shoot off our kneecaps, as I said. If you do the next one. The, more, real, more realistically, I mean, I did worry about that one. In fact, I still worry about this a little bit. That's why when you say, can we publicly post this, you know, I'm going like, okay, I've given a talk on this a couple times already. They probably know who I am. Uh, more realistically, we were concerned that they were going to DDoS us. Because if you remember, we only owned the first two domains. If they DDoS uh, our hosts, it'll roll over to .biz, and then they could download their stuff. Okay, uh, next. Uh, so. The biggest question I have, and I still don't have a definite answer of this, is, is why did it take them 10 days to download uh, a new domain generation algorithm? Okay, because that's, that's basically what they did. Um, you know, some of our thoughts, one of my students said, well, maybe the guy in charge of it was on vacation. <laughs> I said, okay, <laughs> that, that could be plausible. I think maybe a more plausible one was they wanted to find out who it was that took it from them. You know, was it, was it a, another criminal group that, the, you know, the, the competition? You remember the wars between the, the Chinese and the, uh, I don't remember, the Russians, I think, a few years ago, and that, uh, um, hackers. And uh, so uh, why did it take 10 days? We know, we know why after 10 days it was taken down, and I'll show you that on the next slide. So law enforcement. Uh, the other thing, you know, I don't know if I was more worried about criminals or law enforcement, but uh, for law enforcement, I said, you know, we didn't, we didn't get any permission to do this. You know, we're, we're cowboys from UCSB, which are called gauchos, right? Which is Argentinian cowboy or something. Um, and uh, we didn't know who to notify. Uh, more importantly, we didn't just want to notify somebody who said, would say, oh, shut it down. Because if we shut it down, then WD.com wouldn't work, WD.net wouldn't work, and then the, rush, the uh, almost said their name, the criminals will you know, own it again. Okay? And so we wanted to get somebody in law enforcement who knew what they were doing. Well, I don't know, how many people in this room would know who to contact? One. Are you the security officer here? No, I'll tell you uh, that you Okay. Okay. Well, so once, you, once you've done that, like now, I could give you all kinds of names. <laughs> but, you know, Sunday afternoon, we're there trying to figure out who to contact. And uh, I, you know, I was blaw, uh, drawing a blank if you, if you go here. So then I said, okay, U.S. CERT, okay? You know, whether you think U.S. CERT really does a good job or not, I figured that might be a reasonable person to contact. So I went to the U.S. CERT site. And, and, and I found it, oh great, it had, a, it had a pointer to, you know, if you've got a problem with, you know, that you discover some security, something or other, go here. And then they gave me a form to fill out, okay? And we'll get back to you. I go, yeah, that's exactly what I want. You know, very, very disconcerting. Finally, I thought about, there was a guy named David Dagan, I don't know if any of you know him, he's from Georgia Tech. And they had been doing botnet research, and I knew that he had dealt with the FBI and, boy, and the FBI, Treasury, whoever you want to get a, a hold of before. And so I uh, asked, does anybody have his home phone number? And fortunately, someone had his cell number. And called him at home Sunday afternoon. I said, hey, David, you won't, you won't guess what we've been doing. You know? And uh, basically, he put us in touch with an FBI contact. 
Um, and uh, he not only, not only gave us the information, he sent an introductory letter about, an uh, introductory email about us um, and so forth. And, uh, and then I felt better because I thought, okay, now I've reached out to law enforcement. I've got a paper trail that says I'm trying to connect somebody. Well, that was late Sunday afternoon. Uh, Monday morning, we still hadn't heard from them, and so I sent a message directly to the FBI guy, an email, and, and said, you know, you got the message from David, and we'd really like to hear from you. You know, we have any guidance about what we should do. Well, Wednesday, we still didn't hear back. And so Wednesday, I knew... Uh, uh, I, I had a friend at Citrix online in town who I know had dealt with Treasury for something like this before, and so I called him and said, do you have a name of somebody? And he said, sorry, the guy I dealt with has his own consulting firm now, which tends to be the case with a lot of these guys, as you can well imagine. And so he checked with the privacy officer who wound up putting me in contact with this DOD Defense Criminal Investigative Services guy who I contacted, and he immediately got back to me, and, uh, which was good, because now I felt even better. And then Friday afternoon, now we're talking, we're talking six days later, Friday afternoon, I get a message from the FBI guy and said, oh, got your email, I'll get back to you. <laughs> I'm going, are you kidding me? And, and I have to say, when I talked to David Dagan, he said, don't be surprised if they're not as excited as you are about this, because there's you know, a lot of botnets out there. You know? I expected a little more excitement than that. Well, 15 minutes later, we get another message from that guy and says, I just read the content of your email. This is great. We've been wanting to do the same thing, but we can't get permission. Okay? <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and when can we talk? You know, can we have a conference call? And, and it turns out they were really, they were really good. And they did, they knew about Torpig. You know, they had been, had been studying it and so forth. They put us in contact with a group, which is a group of different security officers uh, around the world who have been very helpful for us to repatriate the data, you know, get it back to the appropriate banks and so forth. So when we finally got a hold of them, it was good. And now if I have to get a hold of law enforcement, it's, it's really easy. But it's difficult. It's, you know, there's not, a, there's not an easy uh, URL to go to. Um, okay, so I said that already about the FBI. It turned out to be very good in the end. The next one, please. Okay, so uh, as I said before, we had uh, over 8,000 separate accounts and 410 institutions, uh, 1,600 credit cards. And um, to get this, I mean, we had to mine the data. We had to figure out what their, what their formats were and so forth. And, uh, uh, to figure out all of this. And then once you know it, like, you know, if I know I've got, uh, how many PayPal accounts did I say? Less than 2,000, but close to 2,000. Uh, what do I do? Just pick up the phone and call PayPal? PayPal might be okay, but Bank of America? I go, what do I do? I go, do you have a Bank of America branch here? Do you have the phone number? I'll call them, hi. I'm Dick Kemmer. I've got a whole bunch of compromised accounts for your bank. <laughs> you know, and you know, they're gonna buy crazy or whatever. So it turns out that, uh, you know, that's, that's really not that hard to do. And in particular, when you then talk to a bank, if you say, we may have some of your credit cards too, can you give us your, your bank identification numbers, which are unique for every bank, and that's how you can search on these things, um, you know, which is the first X numbers of the, of the credit card. Um, and if you say, can you send me your bins? Well, they don't want to do that. Uh, you know, they're very, they're very tight with all of that. So one of the nice things that happened is these FBI guys uh, are actually in Pittsburgh, and there's this, this is a place I was telling you about, the National Cyber Forensics Training and Alliance, which is a group of a whole bunch of uh, security officers from financial institutions. And he, they, uh, the FBI guy put me in contact with them, and basically I'd go to them and they'd say, okay, here's, you, here's who you contact for this bank, here's who you contact for that bank. And uh, what was really nice in some cases uh, it, we got the names of individuals who could go and take care of everything for the whole country, you know, like, like all of Italy or uh, all, all of Switzerland and so forth. They had one guy that was repatriating. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, so if you recall, principle one said the sinkhole botnet should be operated so that any harm and or damage 
to victims and targets of attacks will be minimized. Uh, we collected sensitive data that potentially could threaten the privacy of a victim and you know, completely uh, uh, threaten them. One question, which I mentioned before, should emails be viewed at all? I mean, there's people that feel very strongly you should, you should not look at that at all, even, even in a data mining way, which, you know, which we were using for those things. And then uh, the next one. A lot of my academic colleagues, after they saw our paper, asked this question, did you have, I, I, if you're not familiar with IRP, IRB, Internal Review Board? They're the ones that, uh, and, and for us in academia, whenever we put in a, a grant proposal, there's this thing you check and it says, are you dealing with any human subjects or anything like that? And we go, no, nah, we're not doing that, no. Right, and of course on this stuff we put no, <laughs> you know, because if you say yes, then they get out this whole stack of paper they have to fill out. Well, it turns out we're, we're not working with human subjects, and uh, we didn't plan on getting this kind of data, so we said no. But there's this other little catch in there, any data that can be used to identify an individual needs IRB approval. Well, I now have IRB approval. You know, unfortunately, I got it after the, after the fact on this thing. But it's something just, you know, in particular for people that are working on this thing, you know, as a legitimate one, um, you have to do it. Like, I won't ever put anything in again there where there's a chance of me getting this data without getting IRB approval uh, first, okay? And I still don't know about the email and stuff like that. I mean, we're kind of backing off from that <coughs> as much as possible. I'll say, so conclusion, we had a, a you know, other people have, have, have gotten data on botnets. Uh, generally, uh, one of them, there's one, one on Conficker, which a former student of mine was doing at, uh, who's up now at SRI International with Conficker, collected a lot of data where they, where they posed as a command and control, but they didn't know the protocol to respond to it. So these places would connect once. And so if you do these passive sort of things, you get a partial view of it. We were fortunate, we got everybody on Torpig, you know, during that 10 day period, connected to us. Oh, I thought of something I forgot. Can you go back a slide? Another slide? Okay, it's gonna take too long. I wanted to say something about the FBI. One more. Okay, FBI was very good to us. Okay, I want to tell you why it was 10 days. Okay, on, on Monday of the second week, we were having a conference call with the FBI guy, and he said, is there anything we can do for you? You know, because you know, we're doing the usual thing, anything you want. And we said, in fact, Giovanni Vigna, who was my colleague, said, well, we only own the domains for the three weeks out, you know, and a week and a half is almost gone. And the criminals own them for the three weeks after that. If you could, you know, if we had a way of taking down their hosts, or, you know, or the domains uh, names, uh, then, uh, you know, maybe we could, you know, get in there because we already, the other thing is after they signed up for dot, dot com and dot, uh, net, we signed up for dot biz for those three weeks, so it would have rolled over to us. So there's any way you can knock them out. And he said, oh, we could probably do that. And we said, well, we, you know, they're, they're registered in, you know, in these uh, people that are well known for not responding, and he said, everything comes back to the U.S., you know, very confidently he said that. And so uh, Tuesday at about 11.30, we got an email from him and he said, their domains are gone, <laughs> okay? And sure enough, we checked and their domains were gone. And 45 minutes after that, they downloaded a new Mebroot binary, a uh, new Torpig binary on all of the machines through Mebroot. So it was kind of, the FBI also had a bad side effect for us, you know, on that. But in the, and so, in trying to answer the question of why did they wait 10 days, I think that sort of uh, answers, you know, if they thought, hey, this is our competition and we want to know who they are, see what they do, so, you know, we can decide how to do it, they knew when it was taken down probably that it was done by law enforcement and, and decided we're going to, you know, we're done with our learning curve, we're going to take it back, you know, and so that was a 10-day. Okay, so conclusions, uh, we had, you know, we had lots of stuff to look at, and we still have. I mean, we, we obviously haven't mined all of this data yet. Um, um, oh, the thing about distinct IPs, you know, they're, they're probably overestimated by an order of magnitude. Um, botnet victims are used 
our users with poorly maintained machines because they have the vulnerabilities available. They choose easily guessable passwords to protect sensitive data. And then this last one was just you know what I told you about, just interacting with registrars, hosting facilities, victim institutions isn't always easy. And uh, you know obviously I didn't do this alone. Uh, Chris Krugel and Giovanni Vigna are two faculty members who uh, were, were the security lab uh, uh, advisors, and these were the students that worked on it. Uh, Brett was the guy that noticed that it was uh, not being used, you know, three weeks out or whatever, and uh, and then the rest of them participated in in their ways. And uh, questions. That's a place I have to live. It's really awful. <laughs> I hate it. You know, it's a, I wish we had traffic like I had coming over to Sepulveda Pass this morning. <laughs> okay, yeah, questions? Yeah, I was just wondering, like, um, do you see any changes in the public binary that they're using more of an asymm asymmetric encryption to protect their command and control system? Um, they went to a new encryption algorithm for the, for the Torpid command and control and it's been broken. So one of the things that's happened uh, okay, I shouldn't say what I was going to say. Anyway, there's a, there, there's, as you may believe, there's a group of, of researchers and, and some, some folks working with, particularly with financial institutions and so forth, that are interested in, in what's going on here and sharing data and so forth. Uh, it turns out that the uh, Torpig, since we did this, uh, they've changed their encryption algorithm several times for Torpig and it's been, it's been broken every time, you know, fairly quickly, okay? Mebroot still has it. Now, one might ask, well, if Mebroot hasn't been broken yet, why, you know, and if it's the same people, well, this, again, may be part of the underground cyber economy. It may be <coughs> the Mebroot guys are selling their services to the Torpig folks, okay? And Mebroot's doing their, you know, not ready to sell their, you know, encryption that they used. Well, but you mean just to make them feel good? Pretty much. Oh, could be, could be, yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, it's because those weren't old, those weren't uh, new ones. They were they, they, they were new new ones hitting us in the ten, in the ten day period. So, uh, I think it, I think that drop was if you looked at the date, it was February fourth, which was when we lost it. So it just went down like that. It was I, I, huge spike in the beginning is because they weren't truly new; they were new to us. Okay, you know, that was a spike of, so if you've got people that were infected two weeks ago or a month ago or whatever, who are still command, connecting to command and control every, every 20 days, that, that's us. So that was those. And then uh, the new ones were, were going across. But when you saw the drop, like, when, like even the, finan the new financial institutions, I don't know if you guys got the pointer to the paper on this. Uh, did you send that around or? Anyway. I knew Orr's had it because he told me he was uh, reading it. But uh, uh, there's a paper, and I can give you the pointer to it if you wa if you want. It's well, it's going to be in if you go to our site, you know, UCSB Sec Lab, it'll be there. But but those those slides are there. But even on the new accounts, which was fairly flat right to the thing, but then you see the drop because it was that was February fourth. Okay, we when we lost a botnet, yeah. Yeah, and so it didn't drop off just like that because not everybody got downloaded the stuff, you know, immediately. Yeah. The other question was Seattle. Seattle. I thought that Seattle, if you ever get a chance to visit Seattle, would it be an opportunity to possibly look at the Seattle Cyber Security Center? Because that's where the Seattle Cyber Security Center is. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, and the other thing that happened, I'm trying to see your reaction, but I see that it's not <laughs> caught up. I, uh, the other thing is that uh, um, most of the machine, or a large portion of the machines were also infected with other malware, you know, when, when we had reports on stuff like that. So I think it would be good to notify them. I don't, I don't want to get in the game of actively downloading stuff on your machine. Okay. Yeah. Someone else could do that, though. Yeah. Yes. Are there any effective means of disinfecting these things that you guys mentioned? Are there any what? Effective means of disinfecting the machines, or anyone? Uh, have any effective protection in the for Torpig? Yeah, I, I, there is some out there, but I, I I could look up. I don't have the direct reference for you, but yeah. Well, we've we, we don't notify, notify individuals, but we've notified the banks, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, I, have, I haven't notified them all. It's a time-consuming process, yeah, yeah, no, I you know? Understand. And I did it. I was interested to do it because, as I said, we're, we're, on, uh, we're actually on the first year of a four-year uh, NSF grant to look at this stuff. And so I'd like, for me, it's an advantage to, have, to know the bank people and so forth. And so I use that as a quid quo quo to to get to know those folks, but it gets old after a while, yeah. you know, and uh, I, you know, I think my, my grad students are tired. I go, here's, here's a new set of bin numbers. Can you look them up? Or here's, a, you know, here's the banks of interest. You know, what domains do you want? And you, and you think like uh, somebody like, like the Bank of Scotland, we said, you know, they said, do you have anything? And we said, oh yeah, we have some, because some it's, it's obvious that it's uh, UBS or something like that, United Bank of Scotland. And so we, we shipped that to them. And then they said, oh, here's some more domain names that we have from Scotland. <laughs> There's a pile of these others that you're looking for. And it's, you know, it doesn't take a lot of time, but everything, anything you do takes time. But it's not, and it hasn't all been repatriated, but I gave all of it to the FBI and said, you know, you guys deal with it if you want more, so. Can I ask yeah. a question about yeah. the time frame? Yes. You said that the time frame indicated the time the host was infected. Yes. Uh, yes, we did some, but I don't have anything specific to tell you about it. What I remember are there's two days, two days that had a big spike. And uh, our conjecture was that there was some new, very popular, one or more very popular um, website that had been recently compromised. Yeah, yeah. Well, it turns out that some other research that's not in this paper that we did is we also you know, when, when, you go to, when you go to the legitimate site, it downloads the, the HTTP tag that goes and runs some uh, JavaScript that connects you to the, the real download drive. So it turns out that that site changes all the time, somewhat like Torpig. And we figured out that algorithm. We actually owned that site for a while. So we knew which sites were infected you know, initially, which legitimate sites, which is nice information that we tried to get back to these folks with also, yeah. But that was, that's a game that was very hard to play. It was like <laughs> every day, daily. Anything else? Okay, thank you. Thank you.